Hi, and this is Privateer Station. And today, in light of recent interview of Tucker Carlson, we thought it makes sense to dive deeper under the hood of Russian economy. Is everything so cheery and beautiful as uh, Vladimir Putin was uh, telling in his interview? Can Russia still hold? What's happening there? And for this, we turned to an interview given recently by Russian economist Vladimir Milov to the channel of Michael Naki, a rather well-known blogger and online journalist. I think you can get the glimpse at the real picture in light of this interview. Authoritarian propaganda says one thing, while in reality, everything is very different. I know certain right-side politicians are running around saying that, look, Putin is now an authority, looks how he speaks, he has ideas, he is a leader. No, he is a bloody murderous tyrant. There is a trace of blood behind him for 20 years. If you dive deeper into serious who is Mr. Putin, you can see that. Do not trust anything that comes out of his lying, murderous mouth. And now a little more about the real Russian economy. Enjoy. Hello, Vladimir. Another week has passed. Let's uh, discuss what uh, has become known, what numbers, what facts, and what's happening with the Russian economy. Tell us, please, what you paid attention to during the last seven days. Hello, everybody. A lot of numbers, and it's a very fruitful week. It's the beginning of the month, and everybody is publishing a lot of different stats. Let's start with the budget, probably, because that's one of the main questions with people when Putin will run out of money for war. And we generally are moving in that direction. Minister of Finance of Russia published the data about uh, Russian budget for January, and there are several interesting points there. First of all, there is some deficit, 308 billion rubles, and uh, they did not uh, do what they did last year. Remember when they advanced all the payments for everything military, and they had a huge deficit in January. And that's when they fell uh, their stats, and for the whole year they're trying to dig themselves out of it. Now they're doing a bit more moderate, and their expenses for January were 13% less than in January of the previous year. So they're already not ready for cavalier announcements and advancements like uh, in 2023. This is probably related to the ask by Nabiulina because 16th of February is approaching. This is the meeting day for Central Bank of Russia on the credit rate. And uh, unfortunately for them, they are still struggling with inflation. Whatever they do, they cannot cool it down. And I think Central Bank probably asked the Minister of Finance to try to avoid all these uh, huge expenditures at this moment, because for them it is very important. If they start to restrict fiscal politics even more, then in the on the 16th they would have to raise the percent rate again. And that would uh, really strain everybody in the economy, all the economic actors. So they did not want to do that. And they probably asked the Minister of Finance to slow down a bit. The overall conclusion is that, looking at January, we did not see a sensational or ambitious budget that they've uh, taken for this year to actually take place. So the growth of income by 22%, the growth of expenditures by 16%, Everything is very willy-nilly. Oil and gas profits are at 600 uh, with change uh, billion rubles. That actually matches uh, the not so favorable prices for oil. And Minister of Finance stopped publishing the price for euros. According to different analysts, one can come to a conclusion that this price was slightly over $60 in January. So it's uh, more or less within or close to the price uh, ceiling said for Russia. And uh, everything is uh, moderate, looks very moderate, nothing is ambitious, nothing is uh, st spiking or sticking out. What is interesting is that the fund of national security has dwindled even more, and now it is less than 5 trillion rubles, it's a liquid part. Altogether it's about 13 trillions, but an interesting point that at the beginning of uh, 22, the share of uh, liquid part, the actual live money on the accounts of Minister of Finance and Central Bank, they were about two thirds of the whole fund. And now it's down to about 40%. And that reflects uh, 
all their investments in different projects and uh, value papers of uh, Russian corporations. So on paper, they do have the money and they have not really disappeared. You can probably bring them back, but it would be a difficult story, a difficult proposition. So they're not too liquid at the moment, right? Exactly. So the difference between liquid and non-liquid is that you can spend liquid part right now. And if it is non-liquid, you will not be able to spend it immediately. It's the whole process how to get that money. And by the way, I also want to highlight that there are another 300 billion rubles that were gifted to Yanukovych 10 years ago during Euromaidan. Those three billion dollars for Ukraine that Russia supposedly donated to support his regime, they're somewhere still on paper in that fund. Although we all know that they probably will never see the light of day again. So slowly, but they are investing that reserve in the economic projects in Russia, and that causes the dwindling of uh, the liquid part on the accounts. And these five trillion of uh, liquid funds that are left, this is not enough. This is very little for them. So I think they will start to be more cautious with it. Now, imagine spend one or two more trillion rubles to finance your deficit and it'll be very thin margin that is left so they will try to save money and they'll probably be very cautious i also built another interesting graph that two years ago when putin started this full-scale war this was the relation of liquid to the military budget and liquid money were two times bigger than the military budget. So it was enough to fund uh, roughly two and a half years. Now that share has changed because military budget has grown at least three times since then, and liquid part of their reserves has dwindled. And now it can only sustain maybe five and a half months of waging war. So a lot of people are asking when Putin will run out of money. We are going to that point. So in two years, the picture did change drastically. They're running out of actual money, the military budget still growing. Even looking at January, you can see that they have to control their expenses somewhat and do not do such a avalanche funding like they did last year. And they already understand that their reserves are running out. So this is an important point to keep in mind about Putin's capabilities to conduct war in this year. So for this year, he probably will be still, he can still manage. But if they continue doing in the same fashion, they will not uh, be able to run for too long. So literally, this year they can somehow plug. The next year is under a huge question mark. Especially if the West continues to support Ukraine, then next year Putin will be in a much more dire situation. And I think to last until Trump becomes a new Russian national idea. So tell us, please, how does it match with other estimations that Russian economy is the first in Europe, like Putin said in his recent interview to Tucker, or Western notes that Russian economy somehow is uh, stable and sturdy. You can see different opinions and publications on one side. Some people are saying that he is running out of money on the other side you figure uh, that no he still has some so in between these two different viewpoints how do we find the thread of truth that is closer to reality <coughs> given that these estimations are very often based on the economy that we bring up here and the numbers that we show so what are the key points we can rely in our analysis of russia and why is it so different in different publications when they pick, you know, the smart people uh, who don't really treat Putin well, pick the numbers and come to very different conclusions. All right, the overall note about that, that there is a lot of different economic data. And generally, if you want to draw a bad picture or a good picture, data is available. You can cherry pick the numbers that would fit your vision of the world. The difference is that you and I here, we do a wide review on different indicators and putin and the monetary fund 
uh, International Monetary Fund or some Western journalists, they indeed engage in cherry picking. Same thing that Putin likes doing with history, going back to his fascinating interview to Carlson. He is picking only interesting things that he uh, likes from history. So Bogdan Khmelnytsky asked to be joined to Russia. That's what he's talks about, talking about. He is not talking about the fact that Bogdan asked for a huge autonomy in order to be that, and that uh, the fact that uh, Catherine the Great cancelled this autonomy later and started the forced Russification. So he's uh, conveniently avoiding these other facts and only cherry-picking the ones that he likes. Same story about the fifth economy of the world that he talked about. There is a parity of purchasing power. This is a very narrow story that is used only to compare the daily level of life. It can only be used for that. It cannot be used to estimate the competitiveness, the overall state of economy, the investments or anything else. So when Putin is talking about fifth economy of the world, I have a very simple answer to that. Then recalculate Ukraine in that fashion too. Because Ukraine then, on the same parameter, with the fallen economy because of the war, if you recalc on that KPI, it, the economy will actually still be in pretty good shape. It will be huge. So don't trust what he says. I, when, I, when, uh, when I saw his meeting in Khabarovsk with some entrepreneurs, and he was telling them that we had uh, exceeded Germany and will exceed uh, Japan very soon on that KPI, I'm looking at the faces of entrepreneurs meeting with him and I see how they see incongruence in his statement. Because they live there in the Far East, they trade with Japan and they understand that the whole Russian economic power maybe can compete with one big prefecture of Japan. So that specific KPI recalculation, fifth economy of the world, that's pure manipulation. It's a little more difficult and complex with uh, the growth of uh, GDP. What I recommend to everybody to never limit oneself to estimation of just uh, GDP dynamic, because in a peacetime, it is generally a good indicator how economy feels itself. But in military times, everything shifts because of huge expenses into the military sector, just for military production. There you have rapid growth, but this is a generally smaller sector of economy, which by itself doesn't give too much to the rest. You know, I want to show a picture. We recently got some fresh data from Russian stat uh, that they published. Here's the chart about three most important KPIs of real sectors of Russian economy. These are official data from Russian stat. 3.5% growth of industrial production, agriculture, minus 0.3, transport, logistics, uh, transport carrying, minus 0.6. Show me where do you find GDP growth of 3.6 here? Something is off, right? And even if you minus the military expenses from that growth of industry, and it was the main driver because of the metallurgy, the tank construction, and all, if you minus that, that will not be three and a half. At best, it'll be near zero or even a negative one. So still, even with these numbers, you look at this chart and you ask yourself a question, where is the growth of economy? Um, so if you dig deeper, one of the spheres that gives a very rapid growth, 7.5% last year, was construction and uh, launching of new uh, housing. This is a, a chart. This is a good thing, right? But it doesn't allow for it to become more affordable. But what we see according to December data, 71 million square meters of unsold apartments in uh, multi-story high-rises. So that gives an opportunity, however, to Bloomberg and others to post that everything is okay with the Russian economy, but that very much reminds of the same bubble that is now huge in China. Remember when they built a ton of real estate that stands empty and that pulls everything down the balance of developers like Evergrande and, and the like. So that creates huge holes on the balance of banks. We're going that way, we're not there yet. But this is a fact, this is definitely a factor. And huge tempo of uh, construction definitely is a big influencer, and a lot of it is still unsold. And, you know, this is official data, what they're publishing. You don't need to dig too far, this is just data from the real estate market. So, that gives a pretty number for GDP, but on the other hand, if you minus military expenses and 
real estate construction, there is nothing behind it, really. So the numbers are inflated. Indeed, yeah, they are. The profits of banks, financial sector, um, hotels and restaurants sector has grown quite a bit, but it has very little relation to real economy. So see what we've done here? I just scratched the surface a little, and behind these inflated numbers of GDP growth, the real economy is in a very bad state. Agriculture is in negative, transportation is negative, industry is barely by zero, and only uh, military production gives some positive influence to that picture. So I call upon our viewers, if you have access, dig deeper into the numbers, and we'll try to highlight some of them here. Okay, let's talk about the backbone of Russian economy, about oil and oil refineries, because it still continues. The strikes on oil refineries still continue. We see some reporting about dwindling of oil refining in Russia, something close to 4%. So, so tell us, please, what did you find on this topic? And how do you estimate that area to fare? Well, there are two factors. One is the hits by UAVs and drones on refineries, and the second are broke, breaking of different pieces of equipment. I'm not quite sure what caused those, but I suspect that since a lot of high technology equipment are mostly Western produced, one would expect it to start breaking apart after a couple of years of not getting the proper spare parts. And that's what probably starts to happen. That's related to Nizhogorodsky Kstov uh, oil refinery of Lukoil. And according to that data, they seriously shrunk the purpose, the refining of oil across Russia, overall in Russia by 4% and within Lukoil by 8%. The market is rather compact, actually, and you will see that even a smaller departure from production rates definitely affects the overall price. And I wanted to show the map of Russian refineries so you can see how it looks like in reality. In general, first of all, when you look at that, you notice that there are quite a few of them. There are not many. They can be counted, maybe a couple dozen of them. And if one sets a task to somehow destroy them or incapacitate them, this is a generally achievable goal. What do you mean to incapacitate them? So you mean certain specific parts? Because the refinery is a huge plant, right? You cannot take it out with a small uh, drone, and uh, the refinery usually takes a span of several square kilometers. So what uh, do you mean by incapacitating? And that's exactly what I mean. You did mention the word cracker. So yes, um, they usually targeting a couple types of very unique pieces of equipment. First of them is um, high octane gasoline, catalytic cracking, that's what it's called. It's a thermal process where uh, a catalyst is used in order to get high octane uh, gas products on the output. And those pieces of machinery are very few. They don't take square kilometers. This is just one vertical installation, and it's fairly easy to see, and it's really easy to hit it. So these ones, they usually are Western-made, and Russia doesn't have anything to replace them with. So Lukoil was uh, hustling to try to find a way to replace that. And as far as I have uh, information, they still have not figured how to replace that cracking tower and stuff. And the other one in Krasnodar, the one that was hit, um, this is the first tier refining equipment. Because on one hand, and it's also important, on one hand it is uh, essentially if you destroy that, nothing is going to the finer refinery steps, right? If you take this one out, then you stop the whole oil refinery. On the other hand, this equipment can be found. So Russia has access to some of that, produces some of that. It's not so unique, but it still takes time to replace it. So, in short, it's not about targeting by, you know, huge territories. No, it's just very precious units of this important equipment that forms a lot of that backbone in Russia. And it is being attacked rather successfully by Ukraine. So, if you look at the map, they have very few of those high-octane, high-level refineries in the European part of Russia. There is only Moscow refinery of Gazprom, 
There is Luke Oil in Nizhegorod, Volgograd and Perm refineries, Rizan center of Rosneft, and that's about it in the European part. There are some factories near Volga, and Bashkiria and Tatarstan, but they're smaller. And there are some refineries in Krasnodar and St. Petersburg, but they're not modernized enough. The depth of refining is very shallow there, and they mostly produce diesel-level fuels. But in regards to high-octane gasoline, one can create a serious strain if you just uh, attack or affect five or six factories. So this is a very Achilles story of Russian backbone. And one can see that Ukraine is sort of coming to taste now, uh, to targeting these uh, factories. And we're just waiting to see when it will start to affect the fuel market. If you look at the prices for the beginning of February, the prices did go up by 30 to 50 copics or cents. And compa that's compared to the end of December. Of course, uh, powers will, in Russia will try to hold it by any means necessary until their uh, Putin's uh, elections, but there definitely is a strain on the fuel market already. And if that story continues, the number of critical pieces of equipment is very small, is very limited. If one figures a way to take them out, the market will have serious issues. We can take a look at uh, the official data on the January and February as it becomes available, but you can already see that the refining definitely went down. And a couple more of, how do we call them, active measures, and they do affect the market significantly. A couple seconds here, interjections, don't forget to click the like button, the share button, that definitely helps us to stay afloat, so please do that. And here's a link to our Patreon, it is also under the description of that video. There you can help us to continue bringing this information to you. And let's go back to the stream, to Vladimir. Okay, we talked about the data of Russian stat and about the real estate market. We have one more interesting topic in that sector, uh, sector. it's overall growth of consumer credit. Do you have any data there that uh, dispels our previous judgments or maybe that add to that? Tell us more what conspired there during that week, what seemed to you the most interesting. All right, so here I combined the data by Russian stat on the results of 23 and information that we get from Central Bank. And it's good, important to connect both things together because Russian stat shows that consumer demand is almost at the pre-war level, although it is not, it's not there yet. You can see it on the chart. But that only happened due to the reason of huge expansion of consumer credit. We keep talking about Russians continuing to borrow, borrow and borrow. And I also made a chart for the whole number of credits given to physical persons. And in my opinion, it looks horrible. So three years ago, the overall number of credits was about 20 trillion rubles. Now it's 32 trillions. So it's a growth of more than 50% in only three years. If to compare with the situation of five years ago, 2018, it doubled. The amount of consumer credits literally doubled. It was 16, now it is 32. So as you understand, one does not have to be a big expert in the economy here. There was no similar growth of personal income during that time. So people are aggregating additional credit in order to keep themselves afloat. And their salaries are A, not growing, B, will not be growing. There are no plans for uh, that growth anywhere in a social economic development of Russia, any growth of salaries, unless you're lucky to be working at the military industrial complex. There, the salaries are indeed growing by about 25% year to year. But this is a very small sector where, at best, there would be uh, several million people working. So there are not too many lucky persons in this regard. So average population getting by by getting more credits, but this story is a finite one. We talked about cooling down of this area. The banks already are increasing the number of refusings. 
and people are coming to take credit without any capacity to show how they can pay it back. So banks cannot continue giving these credits. And uh, the mortgage rates uh, went down this year, the mortgage numbers, uh, because people cannot afford to take mortgages. So this topic will continue to cool down, and that means that demand will not be growing. As I said, central bank failed to cool down inflation with uh, high rate, but the only thing it succeeded in cooling down was the demand. And you look at these uh, charts and you only understand that the growth last year was only due to big numbers of federal money poured into military economy. But this is a one-time story that, that cannot continue. What else is interesting from that data? First, you can see that whatever we're saying, that the sanctions do work. Not as intended, not as we wanted them to, but they do work. And here's the chart comparing export with import in the price value. Export profits went down by a third, and the cost of imports grew by 14%, because everything made in China actually turned out to be more expensive for Russia. And that was determined empirically after that was tried. And this is Russian stat version. I think in reality it's even more expensive. But uh, here is the Russian stat data on increase of logistics because of reorienting, reorientation of all the transport uh, routes to Asia. So on average, it grew up by 45%. Uh, automobile, 31%. Railroad, 46%. Overall, uh, combined, 49.6%. So logistics is more expensive. Distances are longer everything becomes more expensive when you bring it from Asia. Russia is still mostly European country, so all that big turn to the east sounds fantastic on paper, but economically it does not make sense. And one more important point I wanted to bring to light, real salaries and pensions that are discounted for inflation factor. This is also a very telling graph from Russian stat that shows that by the end of the year, real pensions were already in the negative, and real salaries, they are still struggling somehow to stay in the positive, but overall they're in the mood of diving down. And once again, these are real pensions and salaries according to Putin's statistics committee. If you take a look uh, and suppose that there is uh, probably, uh, it, the difference is actually twice in numbers, because the uh, central bank is monitoring and its own resources and polls, together with the Fund of Public Opinion, they uh, monitor observable inflation, and this is generally twice higher than what Russian stat is showing. So if you put that number in the chart, it goes, both, both of them go down in the dip minus. And I'm not even talking about real salaries. If you remove the military salaries from that, the salaries will be in a much worse condition because it's only military that's driving the growth. And the usual salaries are about two and a half times uh, slower and weaker than the military. So everything grew more expensive when they switched to Asia. Import is getting more expensive. Uh, people are holding afloat by huge credits, and it's unclear how they'll be repaying them back, and the growth of salaries and pensions doesn't cover for the inflation. So that's the picture. Of course, uh, there's no immediate collapse, but please give me any positive trend out of all that we discussed here. What can pull that hippo out of the swamp? I do not see anything in these numbers. Yeah, that is a good question that I think worries Russian powers no less than us. So in this regard, tell us about how... And Okay, so there'll be a central bank meeting on the 16th of February, right? What are we expecting from that? How can they change that situation and affect it? Because let's highlight the main problems that we monitor in Russian economy. Big inflation, the fall of rate that we talked about, and we can probably talk about more, and that uh, did not uh, come to an end yet. The oil price that is not so good, not high enough for them to sustain their economy, and economy inflated in some parts uh, by military, investments, but they do not affect the real economy sector in any way. That all creates the situation under which Russian leadership needs to expand the National Reserve, which is uh, also dwindling, and they do have some liquid 
amounts left to sustain them for a period, but it's not significantly big. So what else can the bank do here? Can they raise the refinance rate higher or anything they can do to change any of these parameters? What do you expect in the middle of February? Well, listen, there are no instruments like that. Their central bank is really helpless right now. It's torturing everybody with that high rate, but as we explained quite a few times here, it has no influence on the factors that form the inflation. So if you raise the rate, will it diminish the deficit of qualified workforce? No. Will it make the logistics with Asia cheaper? No, it won't. The change of that rate does not affect the situation with uh, budget deficit and the fact that they're adding more money in the economy to finance war. And this is also a strong pro-inflationary factor. So the rise of this rate will not also change the balance of export and import. That is also not healthy and uh, leads to cheapening of uh, ruble. I think that central bank has only that instrument that is available to them and they're eager to bring to sacrifice economic situation in order to somehow try to cool down the inflation. And that's what they're saying in the open. They're saying that we'll cool down the demand so people would be buying less. This will slow down the economy, if not throwing it, uh, falling it into a negative. And we already see that. They are cooling down the demand, they're cooling down the economy, but the inflationary factors, they're growing from a different place. So for them, that rate doesn't really change much. And I think Nabiulina can find herself in a very difficult position if she continues that difficult monetary and stern monetary policy. And I would risk to suppose, and we'll see in a week, they, they, they might raise this rate for not a full percent, but maybe a half percent, because according to their data, inflation is not going down and they need to show something to do another impulse. So, okay, they will raise that, but it will not affect inflation in any way. And it will increase the human suffering and the business uh, economic actors suffering on the market more. So there'll be likely a pushback. So what's the point? Well, that's the question that everybody is asking. When she came to Congress on some committee on finance market, there was a congressman, a communist guy from agriculture sector who said exactly that. You'll kill the economy, but you will not conquer the inflation with your refinance rate. So even a school kid can see that. But I think what they want to do, they want to cause the, or to attack the infl inflation by cooling down the economy altogether. Generally, it is possible. If the whole economy is about to crumble and die, then inflation definitely may subside. But the cost of it will be so horrible that I think there'll be a lot of screams from everywhere and there'll be a question about Nabulin and her position and her staying in that position and continuing that hawkish policies. And I think that's the question of nearest months when everybody will start really complaining that the exchange rate is huge, that everything is so dying and we're still failing to cope with inflation. I think it's very interesting. It is not even about February 16th, but about all of these uh, oncoming months. It will be becoming more and more a central question that harsh financial policies do not bring any results. If they will be softened to a degree, then the topic of inflation will come back again to that chat. There is no good scenario for them. And whether they will break Nabiulina or fire her, it's not even important. But the dilemma will remain for everybody, that everybody will continue howling about the rate. It will be brought up with all the meetings uh, that Putin conducts from time to time with businessmen, that uh, we should finish the strict financial fiscal policy. But if we finish with it, then uh, Russia gets uh, the whole uh, growth of inflation again. So when you ask a question, what can be done? You know, the simplest answer is to finish the war. You know, that's what. This immediately would cancel so many problems. And then people would not have to find a way to connect the plug with an outlet that doesn't match. A lot of difficulties disappear immediately and some perspectives uh, start shining on the horizon. But yet we have a mad grandpa who decided to become a, an aficionado of history at the end of his life and he's not going to finish the war. So all these problems 
will continue to grow again so we're waiting for the 16th and one more thing i wanted to mention about the inflation it is not going anywhere fresh data for the 5th of february by russian stat so nothing goes down doesn't go down and here's the parade of the goods that uh, went in price highest apples at five percent bananas at six onions at nine percent potatoes almost 10 carrots 11.2 tomatoes almost 12 percent beets at 12.2 cabbage at 20.8 and cucumbers at 26 and a half percent growth price wise this is the growth only in five and a half weeks so our cucumbers are new eggs i guess previous story was about chicken and eggs and now it's vegetables and fruits and i think the story just added to chicken and eggs they did not become cheaper they just uh, appeared back on the shelves and they still keep the high prices yeah everything happens in waves so problems aggregated in one sector start to emanate in a different sector then it reaches certain ceiling and they don't grow after just like those eggs they became cheaper two percent cheaper since the beginning of this year but before that they jumped for over 60 percent so each of these goods it reaches a certain ceiling and sudden price grows then uh, eventually stabilizes but uh, some other product replaces it in a hit parade of most expensive and rapidly growing prices so chicken was replaced by eggs eggs were replaced by cukes and tomatoes and further will continue on whatever comes i think the eggs will come back to that chat room once the costs will increase so again all the factors that lead to increase of price they're mostly of non-monetary character those that are monetary that would be deficit of the budget and throwing more budget means into the economy these are related with war so here in abulina just asked the minister of finance to hold their expenses a little bit and that's what uh, stands behind it but she can't really hold it at large in the long term because putin still wants to finance war at scale and uh, the budget will be in deficit due to that so that inflation is not going away and all that alchemy by central bank that uh, is not going to lead to any notable results in any case and to finish uh, the main things that we are discussing ruble is still around 91 so in my view the epoch of uh, strengthening is over and now it's a different cycle that will lead it to weakening of ruble and i think i'll lose our bet to you that we set for 100 rubles per dollar by the 1st of March. But uh, in any case, that avalanche is at the ready and we're just waiting for the moment when the export revenues uh, will lose their influence uh, as the cyclical event. Oh yeah, and when the elections will be over, right? Exactly that. And that's when they will stop holding it so fiercely. And weakening of the ruble is an expected event for later this year. Oil became a little more expensive um, Brent is again over 80, but in my view, again, it's a temporary thing because it is all related on one side with uh, Israel and Hamas um, not concluding any peace treaty that some traders were relying upon. Again, it doesn't really affect the market, uh, the consumption. It is just a reason for some traders to heat up the prices. And the government of Iraq also started to argue with the United States because of uh, United States supposedly hitting some targets as an answer to their bases being attacked. So, regardless, I do not see that growing into any global conflict in the Middle East, so I think my, my gut feeling is that traders are using these events to just elevate the prices a little bit, just like we saw it the previous month. They amp them up to about 80 and then they release them down, because the situation on the market is rather controlled. The pumping goes good, the demand is rather weak, China, we can talk about that separately, China's economy is really bad now. They cannot get out of their economic pit that they dug themselves into. So this is another factor that uh, slows the global demand for oil. And we'll continue monitoring that. And by the way, next week we can probably already know exactly what Nabiulina with her crystal ball, what did they say on the 16th. So tune in a week later. Sure, I definitely will be waiting to see you here in a week. Bye.